No system screams more retro PC gaming from the 90s than a Pentium 3 build running Windows 98. And it's hard to argue with the popularity of that combination when you look at the wide range of games it grants access to. Allowing both early 3D games to run with ease together with some truly advanced titles from later in the decade, it is a solid choice to relive that golden age. Welcome to Rick's Random Retro in a two-part video where we'll be building just such a system and put it through its paces. What really prompted this project was this case. It is actually an old Intertel voicemail server. It has plenty of room inside, is fairly easy to work in, but above all has that perfect late 90s aesthetic. Kicking this product off is an ABIT BH6 motherboard. It is an Intel 440BX chipset based board, supporting processors ranging from lower Celerons all the way up to Pentium 3. It is a well known board favored by overclockers at the time and should provide us a good base for our build. Here we have our slot 1 CPU socket and 3 slots for our RAM. As you can see, the board can support a wide range of expansion parts. We have a total of 5 PCI slots and 1 AGP slot, which we won't be using in this build, more on that later. We also have 2 ISA slots if we want to install an ISA sound card for maximum DOS compatibility. Overall, a very impressive and flexible board is well suited for late 90s build of Windows 98 gaming. I did go ahead and check all the capacitors, and none of them appear to be bulging, which is a good sign. I had to go ahead and replace the clock battery since it was most likely dead from being in storage for many years. Turning the board around and going to the back is pretty basic but still expected for the time. We have a total of two PS2 ports, one for keyboard and one for mouse, two USB ports, as well as two serial ports and one parallel port. The processor I've chosen for this build is a Pentium 3 700MHz with a 256K level 2 cache and a 100MHz frontside bus. It is the fastest processor officially supported by our motherboard. That said, I've seen plenty of reports of people running even faster processors on it, but perhaps that's something we'll leave for a future video. The observant of you probably know that this is a socket 370 processor while our motherboard is a slot 1. And that's where this handy slot get adapter comes into play. On the right hand side we have a set of jumpers that configures the slot kit. The ones that matter to us are jumper 1 and 2, which in this setup configures the front side bus to 100MHz to match our processor. Beyond that, this is a straightforward installation using a regular serial insertion for socket. As for memory, we have a single stick of 128MB of SD RAM. It's a generic stick of RAM that although it's rated at 133MHz, it'll support our 100MHz frontside bus, board, and CPU no problem. As for our video card, now is when it gets really interesting. This is a Voodoo 3 3000 PCI card with 60MB of memory on board. Partly chosen due to coming across it at a decent price, which isn't easy these days with prices for Voodoo cards on the rise. Although this card is perhaps a little out of date compared to our processor, it has many advantages. It provides excellent compatibility with a wide range of games supporting Direct3D, OpenGL, as well as the 3DFX Glide standard. It also provides an excellent 2D image quality. Put it all together and you have a very compelling board for Windows 98 Retro Gaming. For our sound card we have a PCI based Soundlaster Live model CT4760. It has great Windows 98 support including the EAX 3D audio standard. Looking at ports around the back of the card, we have a wide range of connectivity options for input as well as output. Included is a combined game and MIDI port allowing us to hook up a joystick or external MIDI device. Next for our hard drive, we have a Western Digital 120GB drive with an appropriate model name of WD1200. It will provide plenty of space for our system. We'll of course need a floppy drive for this project. After all, what would a 90s system be without one? This particular unit is a Sony model. We'll also be adding an internal zip drive. This particular one is a 250 megabyte version. This isn't really necessary, but I have a soft spot for zip drives getting my first one in the USB variety sporting a blue see-through shell. It does come in handy for file transfers between older machines. Lastly, we have our CD-ROM drive, something that is essential for our chance to relive the multimedia-enhanced 90s computing experience. It is a 32-speed drive made by Compaq. We now have all our components collected that we need to start this build. So with that, let's get some music going and assemble our machine.
Also, I apparently really can't hold on to screws very well. I should probably invest in a magnetic screwdriver. With our motherboard installed, next we need to take a look at our slot gut adapter again. The board has a chart printed on it telling us which jumpers need to be in which position. Jumper 1 needs to be removed and jumper 2 needs to be in the 2 to 3 position. This sets our front side bus to operate at 100 MHz. Next installing our processor we need to make sure we align the arrow with the notch on the socket itself. We will be using a fairly basic cooler that came with the system for our CPU. I believe it should be sufficient, but if we run into any heat problems, we'll deal with it down the line. Included with the slot get adapter was a set of plastic clips. These help properly secure the adapter into the slot on the motherboard brace by the slot supports. Next, the favorite part of many system builders, the front panel cables connecting the power and reset button as well as activity lights. Fortunately, here it was printed on the board in a way that was fairly easy to read. One should note, however, that due to this case originally housing a proprietary system designed for phone lines, there are some extra cables we won't be using here. I should touch on the fact that this is a PCI and not an AGP video card when our motherboard would support either one. Based on what I read, there was little difference between the PCI and AGP versions of the Voodoo 3 cards. That, coupled with the fact that this is the one I was able to source, I don't feel this will hamper this machine in any meaningful way. Now we start the task of connecting all the drives up to the motherboard with ribbon and power cables. I should add that I'm really terrible at cable management, so I apologize if I offend anyone's senses or go against cable feng shui here.
To install the CD-ROM drive, I had to remove the front panel. It's fortunately a pretty basic design held on with some plastic clips. Simply pulling on it from the bottom firmly was enough to remove it. And yes, this audio cable connecting the sound card with the CD-ROM drive is really too short as it's just enough to reach. I had to grab one from another computer as it didn't have any spares. However, besides that, our build is now completed. With our build completed and hooked up to period correct peripherals, let's do a quick boot test to make sure everything is connected up the way it should be. And we have success! We still have some work to do with configuring our BIOS settings, installing the operating system, and of course checking out some games. Join me in part 2 to see this computer fully brought to life. If you enjoyed watching this video, please be sure to like and subscribe to keep up to date on future videos. Thank you for watching, and remember everyone, stay classy. Mm -hmm.